Iran Chat is brought to you by the American Iranian Council, pioneering the marketplace of ideas since 1997. I'm Kayvon Afshari, and welcome to Iran Chat. I'm joined today by the former lead sanctions expert for the U.S. nuclear negotiating team and a program director at Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy, Mr. Richard Nephew. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You were, you know, one of the key players in the nuclear negotiations. Obviously, you know a great deal about sanctions. Uh, you've, of course, supported the nuclear accord dubbed the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. How would you assess the, the vibrancy or the health of the JCPOA today? I think the JCPOA is starting off in a pretty good place. You know, the Iranians were able to complete the nuclear steps they were required to take much faster than really any outside analyst had projected, including myself. I think most people were expecting it would take until April until the Iranians would have completed their nuclear steps. Instead, they did it by the end of January. And I think that speaks to the urgency with which they saw the need to get sanctions relief and to get the deal all rolling. From that perspective, I think we're off to a pretty good start. It implies that they have a commitment to at least see the initial phases of the deal go through and to ensure that sanctions relief starts to flow, which ultimately is the reason why they decided to strike this deal in the first place. There are recent sanctions that the White House is uh, slapping on 11, 11 Iranian entities and individuals. This is in response to a ballistic missiles test that Iran launched in October. That's right. Now, that ballistic missiles test, it's important to mention, uh, it's not really covered in the JCPOA, but it does violate a UN Security Council resolution that Iran doesn't accept, really. In your estimation, was it the right decision for the White House to slap new sanctions on Iran in this you know, post-JCPOA era? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, ultimately, we were not able to come to an agreement with Iran that resolves all problems for us or for them. And while the Iranian government continues to launch ballistic missiles in violation of their UN obligations and to develop ballistic missiles, which the United States has determined is not in our security interest, I think we have the right and the responsibility to respond to those different steps. In terms of the atmospherics and whether or not that was the right particular time to act or not, Personally, I, I think that it's important to avoid getting too focused on we should do it today or this day to avoid you know, some kind of, of negative vibe. Ultimately, the practical value of the sanctions relief is going to still continue to support or generate support inside of Iran to keep the deal going, even if there were to be additional sanctions imposed. But it is important to continue demonstrating from an American perspective that we won't leave any of our tools left behind. Another one of the challenges that the JCPOA has faced over the past year or so uh, was this visa waiver legislation. Uh, was that a smart uh, move on the part of the Congress and the White House to include Iran in in that visa waiver bill, which essentially would you know, block dual nationals or people who've traveled to Iran from participating in the visa waiver program? And, and does it violate the JCPOA in any way? Well, I, I don't think it violates the JCPOA. I mean, ultimately, there's nothing in the JCPOA that says the United States can't make visa waiver decisions that would uh, you know, enhance its overall visa programs and, and the ability for people to access the United States. You know, ultimately, what does the visa waiver change do? It requires people coming here if they've been to Iran to get a visa. It doesn't deny them travel. It doesn't deny them the ability to come to the United States. Now, whether or not it was a smart thing to do is a different question. In my opinion, the original intent of the visa waiver changes was to deal with the issue of radicalized people coming back from Syria and from Iraq. And I don't believe that we have the same risk of radicalized individuals coming from Iran to the United States as we do from Syria to the United States. So I don't think it violates the JCPOA. I think it certainly makes things difficult between Iran and the United States in implementing the JCPOA. But whether or not it was a smart thing to do, I certainly don't think it fulfills the objectives mm -hmm. that it was set out to achieve. Mm -hmm. Uh, you really argued that it was the sanctions, especially I think since 2010, the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions and Divestment Act, uh, as well as the UN multilateral sanctions under Obama, that brought Iran to the negotiating table and ultimately led to a successful nuclear accord. Um, but there's another aspect to this because you know, Obama made a fundamental shift when he moved from a zero enrichment policy to a limited enrichment policy. And of course, Iran was at the negotiating table with the Europeans in the early 2000s, uh, but they ended up proving to be unsuccessful, uh, perhaps because you know they were demanding zero enrichment at that time. So could it be the case that it has less to do with sanctions and more to do with changing the demands on the American side? 
Well, I mean, I think we have to look at the long arc of this issue. If, for instance, the United States had dropped its zero enrichment posture under President Ahmadinejad and nuclear negotiator Jalili, would we have had the same nuclear deal that we've got today? I think the argument well, we for know. that is, is, is not, well, it's not favorable, right? I mean, ultimately, people like, for instance, Jalili have made very clear that they don't accept the terms of the deal as it stands, which have mm -hmm. got fairly dramatic restrictions on the mm -hmm. nuclear program. That, that tends to support the argument they wouldn't have accepted those restrictions had they been in office. I think the bigger question is the degree to which sanctions led there to be people in office who were in a position to make the kinds of concessions that the Iranian government made to get the JCPOA. I think so you're referring to the 2013 elections then that brought Rouhani into correct, office? Correct, and okay. put a lot of pressure, I think, on the Iranian people, which in turn put pressure on their government to solve this problem. And, and he, that was one of his promises, was to get the sanctions lifted. That's right, and, and to restore Iran's more normal relationship with the outside world. I, I think the, the more interesting historical question you're asking is, had the United States back in 2003-2004 had a policy other than zero enrichment, would we have been able to get a acceptable nuclear deal, potentially even with better restrictions? The answer to that is we don't know. We don't know. I, I think you can make an argument based upon what Zarif and others have come out and said they were prepared to offer at the time to suggest that we could have gotten an even better uh, set of restrictions on Iran and certainly held back its nuclear program more than we did. But I think you can ask a fundamental question of would we have gotten as intrusive a monitoring and transparency regime at that particular point in time, uh, which in my view is even more important than the restrictions. So I, I think while it's useful to think about whether or not our posture earlier on in the process could have yielded a better and different outcome, ultimately, my focus is on whether or not the outcome we got achieves U.S. national security interests and the possibility of a better relationship with Iran going forward, and I think it does. Now that we just passed implementation day, UN sanctions are removed, US uh, secondary nuclear sanctions are removed, EU sanctions are removed. There's a lot of businessmen who are certainly interested looking at this country of you know, 80 million people who love to be consumers, who've largely been uh, denied many consumer goods um, or you know, have had to pay a heavy premium in order to access them. Uh, so can you explain basically what is allowed and what's not allowed, kind of broadly speaking for American businessmen? And we can add the disclaimer that you're not providing legal advice right. in any way. <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. I, I need, almost need to hold up a sign that says that. Exactly, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I think that by and large, it's easiest to think of the U.S. embargo against Iran remains fully in force. There are limited exceptions to that, but they are limited. And I think the terms of the embargo, and, and particularly the risk of, of someone being potentially penalized for facilitating sanctioned business, remains as great as ever. In terms of what's allowed, you know, you're certainly allowed to engage in agricultural, humanitarian, medical business with Iran. You're now, those were the case before the JCPO as well. That's right. Correct? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So that hasn't changed. Nor has it changed that you can provide and, and do trade in personal telecommunications, uh, which has been allowed ever since 2013. And um, similarly, that you can receive now, if you're Iranian, um, support for safety of flight with respect to uh, uh, you know, uh, aviation Civilian services. Civilian aircraft, yeah. So that right. is new. That was added. Well, this is where the change is. So before okay. the JCPOA, you could still get safety of flight assistance under a strict licensing provision. But a number of aircraft industry you know, people didn't apply, and the Iranians didn't ask them to. Under the JCPOA, Iran can now buy whole airframes as well as get new aviation support um, under a simple or under a specific licensing regime. So they actually have to now come and say, if you're Boeing, you know, I would like to export the following number of planes to Iran, explain how. But under the JCPOA, there's no a positive eye to those sorts of, of services and transactions taking place. Just on, so get on civilian aircraft, given this new post JCPOA reality. Do you think Iran is more likely to look to Boeing or to look to Airbus for civilian aircraft uh, planes and parts? Honestly, I think they'll have a mix. I mean, the way the aviation uh, industry works, there is a uh, amount of U.S. content in Airbus planes and amount of Airbus content in U.S. Mm -hmm. planes. That means that without this change, the Iranians wouldn't have been able to buy Airbus or Boeing. It really, mm -hmm. it's, it's a change that needed to be made altogether. I, I think the bigger issue is now they'll be able to buy aircraft from Airbus or Boeing or other Western uh, manufacturers and won't have to rely on either indigenous production or Russian production. Mm -hmm. In addition to sanctions, you also focus on energy as well, global energy. Um, so that's perfect for our discussion here because the you know the key commodity here that Iran is dealing with is of course is oil and, and natural gas as well. 
So what does the JCPOA mean for world oil markets right now? Like, you know, Iran is estimated to increase by perhaps a half million barrels per day. Yeah. What is that going to mean for world oil prices? Well, for world oil prices, I don't think it'll mean much because this has already been priced in by the market. And I think we saw that, you know, yesterday prices went down and now they more or less stabilized at where they were essentially by the time uh, the JCPOA was brought into force. And I, I think that reflects the fact that everyone knew that this new Iranian oil was going to be coming to market. It's just simply a question now of it physically being there. Because we saw the whole thing take place over the course of a year or yeah, so. Yeah, and so the deal is... It was easy to forecast. Exactly. You know, we, we knew in Luzon back... Right. Uh, you know, in the spring of last year that we were going to have a deal and then we knew in July what the deal was going to look like and basically what the timeline would be. You know, I think that speaks though to the immediate issue of price. The issue of supply to me is a much more interesting conversation. And I think at this stage, uh, what we're really seeing is a realignment of the broader oil industry. We're seeing a number of players in the United States, for instance, start to drop out because they're simply being priced out of the market. But that doesn't mean oil industry in the United States is altogether going away. We're going to see that the Iranians are able to get some access to new markets, but probably not as much as they would really like. And I don't think that we're going to really know what the oil market's going to look like going going forward for another six to seven months when we've really seen this initial glut of new Iranian oil, a lot of the inventory they had being sold, uh, go off the market, and then we're into what the Iranians are really able to produce on a day in and day out basis. Richard Nephew, thank you so much for joining us on Iran Chat. Thanks very much for having me. For more, visit American-Iranian.org.